Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, CC, hello and welcome at CC, hello and welcome at one, two, three, four, five, six. She sells seashells by the seashore. She sells seashells by the seashore. There we go, rolling. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 16. And it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, The Documentary Life Podcast, and The Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Ever since I was a kid, I always kind of dug those end-of-the-year wrap-ups or best-of lists that I'd read in entertainment magazines or the local newspaper or I'd hear on the radio or see on TV. You know, like Siskel and Ebert's Best Movies of the Year or Rolling Stone's Top Albums of the Year. Later on in life, whether it was in the school newspaper or the community radio station, towards the end of the year, I was always looking back in the year and coming up with my own best of the year lists. There's just something about you know taking some time at the end of the year and kind of assessing how things shook out, and then with an eye to the future, gazing into the crystal ball of the upcoming new year. And I'd kind of like to do something similar with today's show, episode 16 of The Documentary Life, a show that I conceived of sometime in April of 2016, and by the second episode, have been running bi-weekly ever since. The initial intention of the show was for me to have an outlet to discuss one of the biggest passions that I have in my life, that of documentary filmmaking. What transpired over the course of the next six plus months was an amazingly organic journey that has transformed the show into what it is today, a place where people can go to get inspired and educated about not only how to practice the craft of documentary filmmaking, but also to discover how other documentary industry people are living out their own documentary lives. And now here we are today, at the end of the first year of the show, and we're really starting to catch a glimpse of what's to come. I hope that you agree that the documentary life is starting to become this beautiful, ever-evolving, you know, and growing community of people brought together by this common idea, or is it an ideal, that really we're not only all creating stories to share with the world, but we're creating our lives and sharing these life stories with the world so that others may do the same. So with that in mind, I'd like to take a little look back at what was the year 2016 for the documentary life. And then after that, I'd like to tell you about some things that I'm excited to explore in 2017. As I already mentioned, the initial idea for the show happened sometime in April. On May 22nd, I'd release a kind of unofficial first episode for the show. It was really more of a, you know, like a soft open for the show. It was basically a 19-minute introductory episode. And looking back on it now, it was a little bit rusty, a little bit serious, and a little bit slow. It also contained a theme song of which, while nice and happy and jingly, it didn't ultimately fit the overall feel for the show. So now, let's check out some of that aforementioned rust and seriousness. Hello, 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 and welcome to the very first episode of The Documentary Life, a podcast in many ways about living your dreams, more specifically, your filmmaking or documentary dreams. 
I'm the host of the show. My name is Chris G. Parkhurst. Chris is the truncated version of Christopher. The G stands for Gregory, my father's name, also my middle name. Parkhurst is my last name. Some people like to shorten it and call me Parky. It's a good nickname. You can call me that if you'd like. Regardless of whatever you call me, I am your host, and I am here for you. In hopes that you can soon be leading, if you're not already, a documentary life. A little bit about who I am. The grand opening, if you will, would happen a month later on June 30th, with not one but two episodes, which would be the groundwork for what would become a signature format for the show. A twice per month show that consisted of one show and topic completely hosted by myself, and another show that would be a shared conversation between another documentary industry person and myself. I say shared conversation instead of interview for a reason. I wanted these particular shows to be less of a formal question and answer kind of setting and more of an informal, real conversation between two people who have a shared passion and most likely shared experiences. In a bigger sense, this is really a reflection of the show as a whole, one big shared conversation between all of us documentary filmmakers. So now seems like an appropriate time to share some of the nicer moments that have happened here on the show, in particular with our documentary industry guests, which again happens once a month. Let us begin with my very first interview, or should I say shared conversation, although it wouldn't be released until episode 7, which by the way was kind of a risky or scary thing to do. Because it was my first interview for the podcast, but it would play after six others had already played, if the interview itself or the editing or the sound quality of the recording weren't exactly up to par, I risked sounding like I'd taken a step back from the previous episodes. But as it turns out, there was nothing to worry about. I mean, sure, the sound quality wasn't amazing. I was using a two-channel mixer that I would never use again for the program. We did the recording in a tiny, terribly echoey space. But I learned on that day the importance of content that people, including myself, would forgive some minor technical glitches if there was an interesting conversation being had. Which, of course, if you've listened to the show with Scott Squire and myself, there certainly was. I drove up to Seattle a couple of days prior. I was very excited to meet another documentary filmmaker who had done work in a country where I had also worked in. Not to mention I loved he and his wife Amy's film, Drawing the Tiger. I immediately felt a kinship with Scott, knowing that he had seen and experienced some of the same stuff that I had with Journey to Kathmandu when I was filming in Nepal. I saw the potential for TDL Podcast to be a connector for people, for others to feel like I'd felt when meeting with Scott. I wanted to do more of this idea of networking and facilitating connections for people. It has since become a central part of TDL, this idea of community building and bringing people together to share one another's knowledge and passion. And really, in this interview, it's, is where the seed was planted. Let's take a listen to a moment where Scott talks about how he and Amy made the horrific events of the death of their film subject into a positive, impactful story. Everybody, by the time you're by the time you're 15 or so, you've probably had some experience with suicide um, uh, around you, unfortunately. It's prevalent enough uh, across human experience that, you know, most people have been touched by it at Absolutely. some point in their life. And the closer that touch is, temporally, emotionally, the more problematic it can be to have somebody else's suicide drop in your yeah, lap in, a, right, in the middle of a right. story you've become invested in with, yeah. a, with, a, with a character you've become invested in. We really constructed the story so that it mirrored the arc of, of our, I say our, I mean mine and Amy's um, journey with the characters, with the, with the arc of the story. So we went yeah. in yeah. kind of naively, kind of excited about the potential and fell in love with this character and began to see what possibilities she had in her life yeah and then bang it's cut it's cut short in in real life we didn't really know where we we're going we just knew we had to keep telling her story we had promised right. shanta we were telling her story we would tell her story yeah and we couldn't not do that it was compulsive i mean in that passion project way. I, I wouldn't have been doing that if we did. If we felt like we had a choice. Last fall in November, we had a great honor of taking the film back to Kathmandu for a couple of screenings. It screened at the Kathmandu International Mountain Film Festival and at Film South Asia, but both of which were are, are well-regarded South Asian festivals. Absolutely. Um, and while we were there, 
we hustled the thing around and, and talked with a lot of people and through um, through a connection at the U.S. Embassy and through a connection that we made ahead ahead of time on the suicide uh, suicide awareness tip. So we hooked up with some with a, with a suicide researcher, uh, Ashley Hageman. Um, is a, a PhD candidate suicide researcher who was working um, uh, uh, on a project partly funded by Fulbright um, and who worked with us to pull clips and create presentations to bring pieces of our film to groups of students in Kathmandu. And, we, and while, while we were there, I think Amy and Ashley had three or four presentations which were really we really well received but the audiences of largely of, of high school aged or young college aged women were just wrapped just blown away and 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 their and their teachers also were interested to learn just the very idea of suicide awareness of of the fact that there might be a, a hotline that you could call if yeah. you were thinking about suicide or if you had questions about suicide um was entirely new and, and, and really exciting. It seemed really clear that, uh, that there are a lot of people thinking about suicide with no outlet. Um, and so that's, that's the jumping off point for what we think is, is probably our, our biggest make the film work yeah. um, project is to get it going as part of, a, as, you know, to build out a little suicide awareness and prevention curriculum that we can take out, send out in Nepal. <laughs> Faith Fuller is a guest who I had on not all that long ago, back on September 30th. What a treat it was to put a face and voice to this person whose website, desktopdocumentaries.com, I've been using for a number of years. For anyone not already familiar with the website, it's basically this amazing resource for first-time and zillionth-time documentary filmmakers alike. Not to obsess about numbers, but just for the sake of clarity, after having Faith on the show my numbers very quickly went into quadruple digits. Now, they may not seem like a big deal to you, but to put it in more of a context for you, the show had only been running for barely four months at that point in time. And I'd been hovering around the total 900 downloads mark, which again, may not seem like an awful lot, but for a brand new show, just starting to build an audience, it's a pretty sizable sum. Well, let's just say that after having faith on the show, she blew those numbers out of the water. And it's no wonder. Just take a moment to listen to Faith discuss how being brought up abroad and living in other cultures has shaped the way in which she tells stories. I always told my parents the biggest gift, the best gift they ever gave me was the opportunity of living in another culture. (laughs) It's, It's profound what it does to a child. And I just know that it has shaped who I am, how I see the world. And it doesn't make me afraid of people who are different than me. Yeah, right. Someone who (laughs) looks completely different than me, who sounds completely different from me, can be a, you know, a phenomenal human being. Mm. And it's, it's learning to respect people from wherever they are, wherever they've come from, and to value them and to just not be afraid of them. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, you just learn how many phenomenal people there are around the world. And, and it's important to step out of your own tribe uh, to, see, to see what's being offered by other people from, from completely different per- perspectives, perspective than yours. And, so it makes yeah. me a better person for sure. Absolutely. And, and, and how do you feel that's reflected in the type of work that you do now as, as say a doc filmmaker? Oh, I mean, it just makes me fascinated by life. Hmm. You know, it just makes me fascinated by different people and different stories. And that's kind of back full circle to what I was talking about at the beginning. I'm just, I just know that there's incredible stories out there that never end. If you're anything like me, you appreciate a good checklist. I've got all kinds of checklists in my life. Every night, I'm creating my to-do list for the next day. Whenever we go camping, I have a camping checklist. Whenever I go out on a shoot, I have a checklist with all of the gear, shots, and B-roll that I'll need. 
So one day I thought to myself, why not some kind of checklist for doc filmmakers? And so I came up with one. It's called the Documentary Filmmakers Essential Checklist, and it's completely free to any doc filmmaker who wants to learn the essential aspects of making a documentary film in the modern day industry. I am all about empowering documentary filmmakers, and this course does just that. It is my sincere hope that this free course will help make your doc film's journey truly the exhilarating and rewarding experience that it can and should be. Enroll today for free by going to thedocumentarylife.com slash courses. Meeting with Lydia B. Smith a handful of years after I'd seen her film Walking the Camino and witnessed her amazing talent for basically bringing people together and, and forming this grassroots crowdfunding firsthand at the screening event she held here in Portland, Oregon in the USA. It was a real pleasure. She, her dog, and I met up on her houseboat down on the Willamette River and recorded a super candid and heartfelt conversation. Along with a host of other things that she spoke of, she talked about the importance of getting your relationship with money right in an effort to better enable yourself to fundraise for your own film. One of the things I always tell people is what's really important is for you to clean up your relationship with money because so many people have such twisted feelings. Oh, I was wondering if my dog was going to be an issue. She's now uh, chewing listeners. on her pizza. <laughs> <laughs> She's got pizza with her. Yes. What, I, what I've realized is myself included, mm. lo lots of us have issues with asking for money. It makes many of us feel less than or like you're doing me a favor by giving me money right. so i feel indebted to you oh, absolutely and so that's what needs to get cleared up and i had the great pleasure of working with a woman named lynn twist she wrote a book called the soul of money and she also um is a consummate fundraiser just amazing and she um, she raises over a million dollars one day every year for her nonprofit. Yeah. And, and she's like, I love raising money. And she's so... She has fun with it. Yeah, she does. Yeah. And she's great at it. And I worked with her for, I don't know, a couple of months. But what I really realized is we really all need to work on that. Because if you feel reluctant to ask for money, mm -hmm. people are going to be reluctant to give it to you. If you're not... And you feel that, do you think that's because they're thinking you don't have confidence in yourself or you don't think you can pull that off? Why should I entrust that into well, you? Well, maybe. Or... I think it's just a mirroring of energy. Yeah. Things have to match. And if you're like... You have to oh, have vibrations well, that are in alignment with it. Yeah. It has to be in alignment. and. Yeah. So that's one book. Um, there's also a really great book um, I tell people about called Spiritual Economics. Yeah. So that, and then the other thing I encourage people to do is Lynn has a, um, I think it's a three tape workshop called Fundraising from the Heart. And it really talks about fundraising from the line of like, I'm giving you an opportunity to invest in what you believe in. Do you think... Right. Do you think, well, for my people, you know, people that have walked the Camino, do you think the Camino is important? Do you think this is something that people should know about? And so it's, it's much more of an opportunity and it's looking at money as a flow. And really it's an opportunity for people to give. And what most of us have a big problem with is receiving. And if you're asking for money, you have to be able to receive it to be able to keep asking for it. And that's, I was really blessed because so many lessons of the Camino kind of fit so well into the making of the film. For me, the journey of the making the film was so much like walking the Camino and learning how to receive is a big one. Speaking of raising funds for your film and getting right with money, the most recent guest of TDL was author and film funding consultant Maury Warshawski. Maury's book, Shaking the Money Tree, is one of the Bibles for documentary filmmakers looking to find unique, fun, and creative ways to raise ample funds for their film projects. What stood out to me about Maury was how much he stressed the importance of doing a certain amount of personal work before setting out to do the professional work. His triumvirate, if you will, of a mission statement, core values, and vision has really inspired me to not only take a look at how I approach my current and future projects, but also to apply this approach to other critical components of my life, like my business and my personal and professional relationships. If a filmmaker wants to consult with me, uh, 
then I'm very strict about this. They have to do a two hour initial consultation with me right. that begins that begins with rectifying these three large issues. Give me a um, maybe a, a real basic sort of idea, and I'm going to throw sure. out the three sort of tenets here, if you will, um, for a filmmaker that you're talking with. How do you explain what are core values? What are you looking yeah. for? So let me get in, into these three. So yep. uh, the core values are who you are very deeply that you can't change. Uh, and these are the basic values that you've been stuck with once you've become a late teenager or certainly by early adulthood and they don't govern your life, but they certainly affect everything that you do. Mm. So if you think back, for instance, on a moment uh, in the last year or so when you were incredibly uncomfortable either in a situation or with a task you were asked to do or a person that you were working with, I would posit that that discomfort had to do with a very, very deep disconnect in core values, that a value you hold very deeply that you can't do anything about wasn't being recognized or was being abused by the person you were with or the action you were asked to undertake. So what's important is that... Uh, um, I think I know where you're going with this. Yeah. Yeah. You need to understand that uh, because there's nothing you can do about it. And uh, it really affects uh, how effective you can be in situations. Uh, So when you're in a situation where your values are not being held deeply and respected, you are going to be very, very uncomfortable and unhappy. Uh, And eventually you're going to either have to get a divorce or leave. Because the core value disconnect is an irreconcilable difference. Hmm. So what's lovely about these three rocks is that they're both theoretical and practical. So that's the theory of it. And in practice, here's how you use it. Yeah. The first way you use it is you raise it to the surface and you broadcast it to the world. Uh, And when you are making in selections and decisions about the people you will work with, the situations you will get involved with, uh, the first thing you do is you look at the core values overlay. So if I want to work with a team of people and I'm hiring an intern or a cinematographer or an editor, when I'm interviewing them, when I'm talking to them, I'm asking about values first. Yeah, right, right. (laughs) Right. Yeah, it's like aligning yourself with the right people, aligning, or at least aligning yourself with the people who have the core core values and belief system that you do. Exactly, because that's what you must have that bottom line on your team. Mm. And then skills and skills and talents, of course, are important, but they are secondary to the value. Founder of Northwest Documentary and documentary filmmaker Ian McCluskey is still one of my favorite interviews from this first season. I still feel that so much of that program and what Ian said exemplified not only what so many of us want and live for in our own documentary lives, but also ultimately what I want this podcast to be doing, getting real about one of the most significant passions we may ever have in our own lives, storytelling. The conversation that I held with Ian to this day resonates with me as an incredibly thoughtful, forward-thinking, and compassionate look at what it means to spend one's life living out their dreams, in this case, documentary dreams. I think the, you know, the most inspiring thing about a documentary life is that it is about curiosity and exploration, but the most profound thing about it is that it's also a responsibility, and it is a very if I even dare say it, it's a very sacred role in society, that it is a um, the responsibility of the story keepers, and that means those who can draw out stories that would be silent, but then they give them back to the people who they've drawn them from, or they give them back to posterity and history at large. And in my films and in the films of all the students that come through Northwest Documentary, we always... Um, show them publicly and we always show them in a theater and we always show them with the people who are part of the film 
themselves. And we sit as filmmaker and subject side by side and watch the film together. And it's a, uh, it's a moment of giving the story back. And I just think that uh, with that in mind, as people go out, yes, it can, you can travel to faraway places and you can have great experiences, but it, bringing films in the fullness of that circle really grounds people to that role that is important. And so people who are called to documentary, take heart, you know, take it seriously, because fewer few are called and it's not very sustainable to most, but those who are called, it is a, it's an important journey and it's an important thing to do with one's life. Hello again, everyone. I wanted to ask a quick favor of you. If you like this show, please take a moment, really like 60 seconds, and go to iTunes or your podcast app or Stitcher or however you're listening to the show. Find the show by searching for The Documentary Life. And once there, give me a five-star rating and write up a one or two sentences review showing your support for the show. Right now, I need a little more of this type of activity as I don't quite have the number of ratings and reviews to give me more, more coverage on web searches. I really would like to increase visibility for the show. I know that I have a sizable chunk of listeners. I see the stats every day, and I, I mentioned to you earlier the different geographic locations around the world of people that are listening, but I, I don't have the ratings and reviews to show for it. So please, especially if you're a regular listener of the show, take a moment and give me a rating and review. Heck, you can hit pause on the show right now before you forget and do this. Totally won't be offended. Seriously, it would help me quite a bit. Thanks. So now that we've taken a look back on the first year of TDL's existence, and not even a full year at that, and we've seen the growth and shape of this show from its earliest stages to, well, its early stages, I'd like to now take some time to share with you some ideas and thoughts that have been bubbling just below the surface and will be forming into what will ultimately become the journey that is the documentary life over the next 12 months. First things first, this show, as you know, has so far been bi-weekly. I am anticipating at some point going to a weekly show format. I'm not entirely sure when this happens yet, but it seems like almost certainly it'll happen sooner than later. To be honest, the only thing holding me back is time. You see, I don't have much of it. I mean, who does? I know, I know. But for the time being, this show is an absolute labor of love. And as is often the case with these sorts of things, I'm not getting a penny to do it. Not that I'm doing it for the money. Anyone who's ever met me knows that this would not be the case. Though at some point, sure, I'd love for the show to be generating some sort of revenue. But my point is that while I cherish spending more and more time with the show, well, that's not always feasible with where I'm currently at with my life. Along with this podcast, I'm responsible for a host of other things like running Barong Films with my wife, Steph, getting our doc feature, Elvis of Cambodia, completed, hopefully this year, freelance work, a big relocation to happen in the first half of 2017, spending more quality time with my wife, my nearly three-year-old son, and my eight-month-old daughter. So yes, lots going on, but, but I absolutely anticipate this show moving to a weekly format, hopefully sometime in the next 12 months. So feel free to send me heartwarming emails of encouragement and support. Or if not, a nice little cash influx to my PayPal account will do just fine. LOL. Secondly, the Documentary Life blog. Up to now, I've been very loose with the TDL blog, but that is about to change. There seems to be a growing desire and need for more documentary-related content. Makes sense. There are things that I can write to you and supply you with more appropriately than I can through the show. I'd like to use the blog as an additional resource to the podcast. Sometimes I'd imagine there'll be articles, photos, or video links that might align well with a current episode. Other times there might be a timely issue, like the journalists that were apprehended covering the happenings in North Dakota and the USA that I'll want to let you know about. So again, the blog will be another place for me to disseminate more documentary information to you. And maybe I can find a way to get some message boards in there as well. I mean, wouldn't that be cool to have an idea to share your ideas and thoughts with other doc lifers? Some of you are already doing that, of course, by leaving comments on the website. But a more formal sort of message board area might be an even cooler thing to have. Anyway, not to stray from the blog. Yes, look for more blog entries to be happening on a consistent basis in 2017. For now, I'll be attempting to supply you with at least one blog entry on the off weeks where a new episode isn't going up, if that makes sense. So 
In essence, the show would run twice a week, and the show blog would be written on the other two weeks. So this next item that I'm about to share with you is something that I've dreamed about doing, and it's been in the works for quite some time. Okay, maybe not officially in the works per se, but it's certainly been in the brain for probably, I don't know, like the last decade. And now with this show, I feel like I've found the perfect audience for it. It's an annual documentary workshop that I'm going to start running. The focus and topics would change, but ultimately, it will be a sort of how-to documentary filmmaking seminar consisting of workshops given by myself and a handful of other special documentary industry people. And here's the really cool part. Each year, we will find a different place in which to hold it. Often on this show, I've talked about some of the developing countries where I've done documentary work, most notably Cambodia or Vietnam or Nepal. As many of you already know, doing film work in these types of locales is a huge passion of mine. Some would call it a sickness. And I'd like to share my practical documentary filmmaking experiences working in a challenging but incredibly beautiful and moving environment with you in hopes of not only helping to inspire and educate you to better tell your stories, but also by introducing you to a whole new culture and geography in which to tell your stories in. So yeah, as details start to emerge on this, I'll be sharing both on the blog as well as, of course, here on the show. I'd also like to let you know that in 2017, I will be sort of officially offering documentary consulting services. I say sort of because I've already been unofficially offering paid consulting services over the past year to other individuals who have reached out to me. I've had a great time doing it, so I'd like to make it official in 2017. So if you've ever thought that you might like to pick my brain about any host of topics like, I don't know, crowdfunding, storytelling techniques, some editing tips, idea creation, etc., let's set up a time to have a one-on-one Skype session and we'll see what we can work out from there. Look for specific details on session packages, costs, etc. to be released on the website in early 2017. Again, that's documentary film consulting services that I will be offering in the new year. Okay, so those are the major things that I wanted to share with you regarding what to look for on the documentary life in 2017. A few more things that I'll quickly mention is an official TDL newsletter. You'll be able to automatically get the latest and greatest happenings with the show, as well as notifications on show releases as well as deals associated with show guests. I'm also starting to put together some ideas for a book. I know, I know, Chris, who isn't? This is definitely a ways off, but again, this is something that I've always wanted to do. I've got loads of journals that I've put together detailing uh, places that I visited and the work that I've done in those places. And as you know, loads of ideas and opinions that I'm more than willing to share. So if the show and blog aren't enough for you, well, there will be a book in the works. I'm also looking to expand the TDL website, not only with more content via the TDL blog, but I'm also going to have a members-only area at some point. So for a small monthly subscription, you'll have access to additional show segments, behind-the-scenes stuff, how-to videos, access to special members-only deals on show guest films or products, maybe a message boards area, I mentioned that earlier, etc., Now, as an old curmudgeon of an industry colleague used to always say, this is written in stone, subject to change. As is the case when making a documentary film, ideas and concepts and wants are all fine and well, and we all need them to start our doc project. But one can never really tell what story is really going to ultimately take shape until it happens. And if we're not open to the various doorways and paths that will no doubt be opening around us as we venture deeper into our film or project or personal journey, then we may risk missing something very beautiful. So with that, I would like to open the TDL journey for 2017 up to you, my listeners. This is your chance to tell me what I can do more of or less of to better serve you. Because without you guys, without the community that we're building here through this show, we'll all be left with some blabbering idiot at the end of a mic just talking about God or Buddha or Allah only knows. Hopefully, it'll at least be remotely documentary film related, eh? But seriously, I'm often talking about my desire to be communicating more with you in an effort to get to know you, my listener, a little better, which will not only give me a new friend, but it will allow me to better serve you. So please, if you've ever thought about emailing me with some ideas, constructive criticism, crude jokes, or maybe suggestions for documentary industry guests, whatever, wouldn't now be the perfect time? So please take a moment and send me an email at chris at barongfilms.com. And that's spelled chris at b-a-r-a-n-g films.com. Chris at barongfilms.com. 
you truly have a wonderful opportunity to help shape the course that this show takes in 2017. So why not take a moment and do just that? That's today's episode of The Documentary Life. I hope that you enjoyed the trip down memory lane as well as the eye to the future of this show as much as I have had doing it. All shows that were discussed and many more can be found by going to either www.thedocumentarylife.com or by going to iTunes or your mobile devices podcast app and searching for The Documentary Life podcast. As always, thank you for taking the time and tuning into the show. And thanks for being on this incredible journey that's been 2016. My excitement surrounding this show and this burgeoning community that we're all building continues to grow. Until next time, I remain your host, Chris G. Parkhurst. Talk to you soon. Don't forget, if you're interested in a guide to help you navigate the fundamental aspects of doc filmmaking, the things that every doc filmmaker should know, then get our free doc filmmaking course, The Documentary Filmmaker's Essential Checklist, by going to thedocumentarylife.com slash courses. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next episode. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.